get cracking. All right, guys, welcome back to game three of Team Liquid versus Navi. It's been one hell of a series so far, and I expect even greater things as we go into game three. And uh, we're going to go straight into the draft right now as I welcome in my uh, my fellow caster. First of all, AC is going to be joining us for the play-by-play, -play, uh, and we'll do those introductions. We also have a lot of other things to get through uh, before we talk about the draft as well. AC, buddy, though, your, uh, your mic's doing that thing again. What's it doing? Is it it's too picking high? up all the background noise again. And we'll hope that fixed it. We good to go? Yeah, sounds sounds good. Okay, that's odd. It was actually registering all clear on my side. Sometimes whenever I have a crash, just the interaction and software causes an issue. But either way, uh, great to be back. And I'll tell you what, man, we've got about two days of Dota packed into just two games so far. A collective. 130 minutes over the first two games and what has been an absolute great series. Best series that I think I've casted throughout 2014 uh, so far, just a, a, in a standalone sense. You know, all other factors taken away. Yes, it's just a group stage and all that. But still, just a phenomenal series so far. Both of these teams taking it down to the wire. Navi battling back to knot things up in game two after Team Liquid stole one and one of the best comebacks I've ever seen in competitive Dota. Can't wait to see what both of these teams have in store for us in game three. But you know how this goes, though. Don't you like we had two very close very back and forth matches it's gonna be like a 25 minute gg wait and see yeah <laughs> of course, the of course. it always just, goes yeah one team's just gonna crush the other but uh we'll, we'll have to see who does it though um real quick though guys we do have to do our uh, our daily rare giveaway i know some of you have just been waiting like when where's the rares <laughs> Where's the rares, guys? Yeah, they're coming. They're coming right now. In fact, uh, we're going to give it uh, about a minute after I talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the other thing that's going on at D2CL.org. We're going to do that whole spiel, and then I'll throw out the code live right here, right now. So be prepared. Go to Dota2Lounge.com slash giveaway. Be ready to put in that code to get your free 10 rares. I'm just going to throw it out on stream. The other two sets of rares, it's 10 rares apiece for each code. The other two rares are going to be up on AC's and I's Twitter. So after this game, we're going to throw out a, a code each, and you guys have your chance to be able to win even more rares. So be sure to be ready for that. Real quick, though, Dota 2 Champions League. They want to be able to make an announcement about Season 3, and they have actually have just gotten word they have it up right now. They didn't actually wait until the match was completely open. They threw it out right now. So D2CL.org, go check out the news segment, and you have everything that you need and every single reason to buy a ticket. We've got basically the it, D2CL is instituting these milestones for how many tickets are being sold, and they have these big, big prizes for, for the community that are going to be, be just extra added incentive. I mean, if the punch set wasn't enough, if, if the excellent games that you're being able to watch right now isn't enough, then this should really put you over the edge. First milestone, 25,000. The Season 3 qualifiers will be available on Dota TV for all Season 2 sick ticket holders. So not only are you buying this, but you're buying the qualifiers as well. See, uh, milestone 2, 30,000, dueling mini ch championship featuring four mid players. So basically, we, we have this only mid championship to see who's the best mid out there. 35,000 tickets are sold. We get another upgrade, which is then we have uh, four different teams going up against each other in an ability draft mode. I know a lot of you guys have been interested to see how the pros fare in the, uh, the very, very skilled arena of ability draft, but uh, you may get your chance. Uh, there are two other milestones that are really, really big. 45,000 tickets sold. We have a gold madness match is what they're going to be calling it. But basically, it's a match that is based on kills, not necessarily the objective. And teams will actually be able to earn money based on the kills they're able to get. So there, there are certain objectives, like a fast Roshan kill before the creeps spawn nets you 200 extra dollars. So that should be just a really interesting, fun match to be able to watch. And then finally, last but not least... And this is the one that really took me by surprise and that, that just kind of shocked me. 50,000 tickets are sold. If 50,000 tickets are sold, viewers will be able to select the city host of Season 3's land finals. Either Kiev, Moscow, Stockholm, Cologne, Paris, or Valencia. Yeah. Kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big freaking deal, don't you think? Yeah, this, this is this is huge. <laughs> when I was like scrolling through, I was like, "Oh, that's that's interesting." Yeah. Oh, a fun yeah. an ability draft, <laughs> and then like the gold match, I was like, "Oh, that's I've never heard of that idea before. That's really yeah. cool." 
And then all yep. of a sudden, land, land finals. <laughs> just, just throwing it out there because I have no doubt with the amazing support of our uh, just truly uh, phenomenal community that uh, D2CL will be able to eclipse that last mark. My vote goes to Valencia. You guys need to vote Valencia too. I was there for DreamHack <laughs> Valencia. It is freaking gorgeous. Trust me, Valencia is uh, awesome. I, all the other cities are great too. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, if you get a, if uh, if I was going to travel to a Dodo event in any city, I would so go lay on the beach or or j- just walk around the beaches and and check the city out and then go watch the land at night. That would be pretty magical in Valencia. So just my two cents. But uh, as Capitalist said, make sure you guys uh, look into getting the tickets and remember, you know, if you want to support this and make this happen and you already have a ticket, you can buy another one and then maybe give it to a friend or sell it on the market or something like that. But uh, thank. Thank you guys. And again, I'm just kind of connected through Join Dota, filling in for Toby while he's busy elsewhere over these last couple of weeks. But still, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with them and more than, more than anything to work with these sponsors, to work with the D2CL to bring you this content. So thanks to you guys already for making this possible. And of course, uh, consider it. Consider uh, maybe picking up a ticket if you haven't already. Consider maybe uh, purchasing an extra one. Let's see if we can hit these milestones, guys. It'll be a lot of fun. All right, well, we can finally get into the draft. Fortunately, it seems like the teams use a lot of their bonus time while we're going over that whole spiel. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait. I missed it. I said I was going to do it. Rare giveaway. I know somebody was like, there you go. <laughs> the yeah. rare giveaway. Somebody's like, I don't care. I don't care. I just want my rares. Give rares. me my rares. All right, the code, dota2lounge.com slash giveaway. You better be there because I'm throwing it out right now. I'm not waiting. F O H L. Put that in. Get your 10 free rares and let's get into this draft, guys, because we are really, really underway here. We've got uh, Nyx Assassin, a Life Stealer, uh, Invoker, Storm Spirit all being banned out. Team Liquid looking at a push strat as they pick up Luna, Nature's Prophet, and Shadow Shaman. Navi, though, have a good fighting lineup with a Bristleback, Ancient Apparition, and a very, very strong laning support in Visage. Yeah, th- what jumps out immediately is Team Liquid. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Since the latest patch, I'm absolutely in love with Shadow Shaman. I think he is a hero that's due to gain a lot more popularity. I mean, we're seeing him played more and more often already, make no mistake. But what the hero gives you in the early and mid-game phases, especially if he gets off to a decent start, he lands a couple of kills, or maybe he's just a part of a couple of early towers, which is very easy. You get him to level 6, you get into position, and you take a tower. That's just how it works. It's so hard to fight past his wards if he's able to get them down before you can get into a defensive position or unless you have some sort of long-range reach-based initiation, be it a puck, be it a storm spirit, be it a clockwork. Those are pretty decent answers. But, you know, that forces you to draft a certain way. He has actually really nice AOE burst coming out from um, from Aethershock. And, uh, of course, the disables, shackles and hex. The hero just has it all. He has burst. He has push. He has counter push. He has... Um, um, the ability to lock a target in with his wards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And seeing Team Liquid pick him up to go with the split push potential of a Nature's Prophet, the late game carry potential, and combined split push potential of a Luna, I really like this core three out of Liquid so far. Navi, on the other hand, adding the Marana to their front three, Bristleback, an excellent hero, but does need to, to kind of like we saw in game two on both sides. You need to get him in control early and keep him in control. They're going to be relying on a lot of very well-chained initiations to make this happen based on the compositions we see so far with Marana Sacred Arrow looking to chain off of Grave Chill, looking to create to uh, chain off of uh, Cold Feet and uh, and the rest. Yeah, right now, uh, Liquid, especially with the Elder Titan pickup, we talked about this earlier. He works really, really well with push lineups uh, because of the fact he's able to throw out that spirit and it's it basically gives you initiation without having to commit anything, right? The spirit just kind of sits there. If it's in a good position, you're able to get a good stomp. Perfect. Otherwise, it's just a zoning factor that it forces teams to actually get close to it in order to protect their tower. So this means very, very easy Tier 1 and Tier 2s. However, Na'Vi have this really good combative lineup. I mean, Rana and Bristleback, both heroes that don't go late very well but they control the mid-game like none other. They output damage that is just uh, unparalleled pretty much, especially the Bristleback and the physical damage he's able to output. The question is, he's one of those few heroes, by the way, who can't actually stand up against an Elder Titan because as much extra damage you get from that spirit, Bristleback gets as much with his Warpath, and then you start throwing down that minus right. armor from Goo and everything else. So Bristleback, a really strong pickup, especially here for Navi, because they need that sort of combative, constantly go, 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 and not just let Liquid set up on a tower, because once they're set up, man, they aren't moving for all the money in the world. 
I'm anxious to see how they're going to end up laning this out. They could be looking to run a potential three core or two and a half core even if you want to send the bristle back into the safe lane, uh, take another mid with your last draft pick here, and then put Marana in the off lane. Very possible they do that. They also could run Dendi mid on the Marana or hell. I've seen uh, seen Navi run bristle back mid before, so their options are wide open to them. For Team Liquid, it seems a little more predictable. They're going to need another support to go with Luna and Shadow Shaman. Um, Nature's Prophet most likely going to be in the jungle slash off lane with Elder Titan, probably taken mid again by Bulba. And really, it was Bulba's playing game, too, that made that game so competitive from Liquid. I mean, Na'Vi, by the time Puppy started to get into his groove and land those black holes, they... Uh, um, by the time that happened, they were beginning to lose steam. Liquid reached that point and was able to extend that game, though, because of the play of Bulba, and they'll want to get him off to a good start. And it will be a mid-Magnus. Now, you know, it's kind of a joke more so than anything. I mean, Dindy has a certain type of hero that he excels at, and Magnus really doesn't necessarily fit that characteristic. Not to say he's terrible on the hero. I mean, he's freaking Dindy. He's pretty good at most heroes he plays. But his performances on Magnus in the past have been suspect, and they're going to need him to really play well here today because when it comes to lockdown they simply have none outside of sacred arrow potential cold feed procs and then of course the reverse polarity yeah so far i i think that i i kind of question the magnus pickup i mean it's good initiation yep. and everything else but i have to say i really prefer liquid's lineup because not only does it have the early game it has the movement with the nature's profit but it's also got the late game in luna now we do have a lot of direct damage we have the direct lockdown with the magnus as well as the direct physical damage with the bristleback so any sort of hero that is able to output that is really really good versus luna especially if the added bonus of their being very very tanky so any hero like elder titan like lifesteal like bristleback are going to go do well against the Luna in the mid game because it means you no longer have, you're no longer limited by the opening of get Luna before she picks up a BKB. Because at that point in time, BKB, Luna becomes a lot more powerful in team fights and especially that level two ultimate. She becomes a bigger factor in team fights and actually is able to contribute a lot. But you're still able to combat that by just being able to either A, have initiation or B, have some good tanky heroes of widespread of damage, hopefully with that eclipse, and just go for that physical damage and just let Bristleback beat her down, even yep. through the BKB. Absolutely. The, the lockdown advantage by far, though, is on the side of Team Liquid. Um... With Shadow Demon there, with Disruption, with Demonic Purge, um, as you know, not necessarily a lockdown spell, but certainly a keep you at stationary kind of a spell, which can be excellent against a hero like Bristleback. Then you've got Shadow Shaman, his full kid. You've got the Stomp yeah. coming out from the uh, from the Elder Titan. I really like the way that they're going to match up, given one stipulation. They need to make sure TC is not only off to a good start. I mean, we always say that. Casters of all stripes, we always say that. Get off to a good start. You know, execute early. That's one thing. His item choices need to be good. He needs to be in position, and they have to pick his shots early. When it comes to Aluna, yeah, sometimes you'll see her just team fight snowball out of control because she hits eclipses and piles up four or five kills early. That's few and far between. What tends to happen is she comes to fights. Maybe she dies once. Maybe she gets a kill once before she starts to get up her big items, her damaging items, etc. So often, the key to playing a good Luna and seeing a Luna executed well at the professional level is deciding when she's going to come to fights, when she's going to split push, when she's going to flash farm. Liquid, very good at that. In most cases, they have the lockdown. They have the ability to keep these towers up with the Shadow Shaman and with the Elder Titan. So as long as TC's decision making is on par, I like their chances moving ahead to the late mid game and especially into the late game. Yeah, and something that they're already doing that I love, dodging the tri lane. The Marana yep. at Ancient Apparition Visage. Now, it's not going to take much because these two supports are just going to rotate to top and they'll join a Bristleback who is not hindered in many ways by a tri-lane either. He's able to do a decent amount, especially if he's able to pick up level 3 before they come in. Uh, the biggest thing about Bristleback, he doesn't want to be in a tri-lane, is the biggest thing is he needs levels. He needs to be able to have mm -hmm. that level 5 at least for Quill Spray to be effective and in, in these sort of drawn out team fights. Otherwise, it takes too long for Quill Spray to really be very, very strong. So I like this initial setup of lanes by Liquid and uh, even to keep a, a single support bottom just to make sure that uh, they don't leave Koipa alone against what is a pretty intense kill lineup from Navi. 
And, uh, you know, something that surprised me right off the bat is the fact that it's going to be Havos farming the Marana. I mean, it's, it's not like it's weird. You know, it's not like he's never done it before. But for a while there, he did play a fair amount of one position bristleback. And I really expected that to be the case. I got to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of a one position Marana. You have to. And Havos, you know, he loves to play aggressive and he's excellent at it. But he is first and foremost generally a farmer. It's what he loves to do. He loves to just get his items, get his gold, and make things happen down the stretch. But, you know, one position Marana tends to be feast or famine. Either it goes really well or really poorly. Phonic, uh, thought we were going to see a disruption, but nope, never mind. Fluff had already spent it. That's why we didn't see it. But but yeah, I mean, this one position Marana, they need a lot out of him, and they need to get it out of him and sooner rather than later. You're talking a 20 to 30 minute window that we're going to look to see a Vost execute through instead of a 40 to 50 minute window. Yeah, they keep on going for this. Look at this. They keep on trying to go for the block off on Phonic. Up, oh, trying to get it. They might. One more auto attack. That's first blood. Now, that is actually pretty disastrous. Giving that up to, to just a duo lane, only two heroes needed to bring down a Bristleback at this level. TC, now level three. But more importantly, that early kill going to uh, going to Team Liquid, the bonus gold from the first blood. But Funic being off the map and losing out in that situation. Bristleback is a hero who needs to always be even at least. And when he gets behind even a little, you do start to feel it. Yeah, absolutely. He's supposed to be this big tanky hero that is very, very tough to kill, but when you start falling behind, not only giving away extra firepower to Liquid, but being fairly squishy on your own right, you just you just never snowball. You never snowball, mm -hmm. and that's a big thing about Bristleback. Dindy and Bulba going toe-to-toe -to -toe here in mid in the meantime, and we can see roughly, even on both sides, a little bit of a lead for Bulba, 14 CS to Dindy's 10. Um, but yeah, I mean, Dindy's Mag again, seen him play phenomenal, seen him play really sketchy at times. It just depends on, on where he is with the hero right now. And especially just the, the nerfs the hero received over uh, consecutive patches going back quite, quite some time ago until recently now. I mean, he got kind of a silent buff with the blink dagger buff, I guess. But for the most part, he just has become a hero that you either play him frequently and you're good at him. A hold on a top way too there to follow up the disruption. Got the shackles on. And the damage might be there. They're going to be real careful. And way to, yep, good juggling of the tower shots. Way to makes it away with 130 HP. Funic down twice already. This is why I'm not the biggest fan of a one position Marana. She's taking a lot of the farm. Funic's been put in a bit of an awkward situation. The rotation was slow in coming. It couldn't, well, honestly, it hasn't come at all from Navi. So prioritizing Havost, this now means your bristle was way behind. And Marana has such a long way to go before she can really put that farm farm to any uh, any big use. I mean, yes, she can use her Sacred Arrow. Yes, she'll tank up. Yes, she'll be a little bit better. But generally speaking, Marana's going to give you what she's going to give you in the first 15 no matter what. Another long-range shackle. Funic caught with the Soul Catcher. There's a disruption. Trying to juggle the tower shots and doing a good job. Can they get him again? Lucent Beam's there. Shadow Poison up to two ticks. Won't be enough. And Puppy's there finally to come and help him out. This has just been an absolute murder field for Phonic, who has been under constant fire for the last few minutes. Yeah, that wasn't even a solid initiation. I mean, the fact that they didn't lead with disruption, had to throw down the shackle, then they were under the tower for so long so they couldn't stay and just beat on Funic. That was mm. a bad initiation, and they still almost killed him. If that last yeah. Shadow Poison had hit him, maybe it would have killed him. Actually, it was only level one, so a little doubtful. Um, but it would have been a little bit close at the very least. But now, apparently, Liquid feeling comfortable rotating in. They're going to put Luna in this bottom lane up against the Marana, which is a little dangerous. I mean, I like what they were doing before, which was Koifo was just jungling. They stayed away from this tri-lane as much as possible, but now TC may get caught out. Sacred Arrow on the mark. Yeah, I'm with you. Why? If it ain't broke, why fix it? I, th this doesn't make a lot of sense to me in a lot of ways. I mean, they anticipated the rotation. Now, Koifo... Way out in front, gets caught with a Grave Chill. He's back under his own tower. No Sacred Arrow. That's probably another kill, but they might get a return on Kuroki. One last auto attack. Not enough. Here comes Waitsu out of the jungle, though. And Fluff helping to run Marana out. So Koikva manages to survive just by the skin of his teeth. But, uh, but yeah, I think they anticipated a bigger reaction at the top. I think they expected KKY to go up there with Puppy and uh, tried, to tried to get a little too aggressive at bottom. Nonetheless, Navi makes their way onto the board, but they end up giving one for one, make it three to one as we come up on six minutes now.
Yeah, the theory was right. The theory was basically that Bristleback was getting to the point where he's actually effective in a tri lane, and that yep. with two supports joining in, it was going to actually be pretty dangerous. So they rotate Luna down, but the moment you still see that Visage in lane, you have to just hide yourself until your other su yep. two supports come in. I don't. I'm not opposed to the the defensive tri lane rotating right. in like this, but the execution of it was rather questionable, and we saw with TC going down exactly what happened. Now just uh, a little bit of the small disruption going down from Fluff. But other than that, not a really whole lot going well for Na'Vi, except for that one pickoff on TC. Everything else should be going the way of Liquid. Even their middle matchup, Bulba versus the Magnus of, uh, of Dendi, is going to be a fairly even trade out where Spirit plus auto attacks. Well, maybe an auto attack might be able to secure it. Bulba skewered back following the Sacred Arrow. That's a big time kill for them. And believe it or not, even before that happened, Na'Vi continued to lead in gold and experience. So even though to the naked eye, it would seem like, oh, okay, Bristle died a couple of times, so on and so forth. It really hasn't hampered them that much. Again, this but this stage of the game isn't really what worries me a lot for Na'Vi. It's, it's how they're going to transition from 15 minutes to 25 minutes. That's really where I feel like they're going to win or lose this game for the most part. TC will have his treads up soon. His item build is a particular interest to me as well. Is he going to go pure greed? Is he going to go kind of greedy? Is he going to go straight up BKB after treads to make sure he can fight? We'll have to wait and see. In the meantime, though, Na'Vi doing work on the Tier 1 mid. Yeah, the, any kind of lineup that really focuses heavily on the mid game is oftentimes exposed for its either its strength or its greatest weakness in the laning phase. And when I feel that you yep. focus so much on the mid game and yet you don't win the laning phase uh, hard, like uh, your Navi is is ahead right now, but I don't feel that they're really doing enough. Like the fact that Bristleback was so heavily shut down, he's it delays him coming into the game. TC is still farming fine. Elder Titan still farming fine, and they had Furion dodging by just being able to go into the jungle. He's going to be pretty good as well. They may be falling behind in CS because of this, but I don't think that Navi are winning hard enough to be able to really make their mid game stick as it stands right now. That pick off on Elder Titan though, the two pick offs, Elder Titan and TC, those were both equally huge when it comes to talking about the laning phase but without those i think liquid would would be looking extremely strong right now we could see liquid recognizing the moonlight shadow had been popped they saw it out of mid pretty yeah it was dindy i'm almost positive was standing on top of creeps csing whenever it was popped so quick uh, quick reactions and watching the map they realized immediately what had happened pulled back under their own tower and they end up walking away with nothing to show for it here comes Fluff joining up with Koikva and TC now. They may try to push this bottom tower. Lucent Beam does catch the Marana. Disruption under his own tower. Shadow Poison, just a little bit of extra damage trying to zone Havost off of things. Up at top, Funic just continuing to farm away. Sitting about middle of the pack in terms of CS. Let's see if they're going to contend this bottom tier one. They do have a glyph if they want to spin it. Visage is six, does have the birds up in the air and looking for targets, but... Yeah, looks like so far no major reactions from Na'Vi. Way too not quite six yet. If he was, I'm sure they'd be pushing much harder. Yeah, this is this is the problem. If you don't make your mid-game stick, I mean, it's kind of showing right now, but not in its true form of when we get into the, the game, the 15, 20 minutes, when you have wards going down, when you have that maxed out aura coming out from Luna, whether she chooses to max it out early or not, we'll have to see. But either way, this team takes towers, and they take it quickly. And any sort of mistake by Na'Vi or not having the strong enough landing phase to be able to make all the team fights work for them. They lose one team fight, they lose a tower, maybe even two. Na'Vi reacts in force now and wisely Liquid pulls back. They do get the deny. And Bulba now in mid. Left to soak up levels and a bit of gold, doing a little bit of damage to the tier one. Now, Dindy is, is really the hero to watch for Na'Vi, especially over the next 10 to 15 minutes. He's very close to his Blink Dagger, only needs another 250 gold. His play in particular going to matter so much. There's a Grave Chill on the TC. Sacred Arrow actually misses, but it catches Fluff behind the fact. And they're going to be able to turn that around. Good disruption from Fluff, disjointed things sufficiently that they didn't even decide to engage on him afterwards. Fearing the Eclipse, most likely, but... So far, we remain at the status quo, make it 3-2. to two. Liquid maintains a short kill lead. The gold lead that Na'Vi had built, it was up towards 2,000, now heading slightly back in favor of, uh, of Team Liquid. I don't think Funnick has missed a CS since Heroes left his lane. <laughs> like, like, seriously, he is sitting at second in, in CS board right now, even though he mm -hmm. died several times in lane. He was he heavily shut down, and he has a Vanguard by 10 minutes. Like, 
that's amazing. The fact that he has a Vanguard after the first five minutes of the lane were a complete wash for him. So this is really, really impressive play by Funic, being able to come back into the game and looking pretty much like the offlane Bristleback that we expect. Like, this is having a Vanguard before 20 minutes, before 15 minutes, is very, very important for, for allowing us Bristleback to be able to push heavily enough, be able to have the lane presence, to not fear any sort of attempt at ganks because he's so tanky, but also be able to provide a lot more in team fights because of it. This is how Bristleback snowballs. So even though he was shut down early and I was expected that to really uh, affect him, he's come back beautifully just by pretty much not missing a single CS in this what is a free farm lane. Yeah, and his level's actually on par with the highest on the board. Only Dendi is higher than he is in levels. And, you know, levels, you know, so far as items, obviously a Vanguard's nice. Anything you get to tank him up is going to be awesome for him. But so long as you have levels, you can usually feel pretty effective um, in the early game phases. But with Funic now, like you said, really just going to town in terms of gold gain since his lane emptied out and managing to stay on par with levels. Navi's looking pretty all right. The net worth showing, yeah, he's actually moved ahead now of the two highest farmers on the side of Liquid being TC and Bulba. So Na'Vi really pulling it together uh, much past the 10-minute mark. Well played. Yeah, and you can't really say the same about um, about TC. Like, oh, we're actually at top. Yep, Fluff caught up, disrupts himself. Here comes the rest of Liquid trying to follow this up. Dindy's there looking for an RP, not going to find it. They pop Moonlight Shadow. And Fluff will end up dying to a... No, he's actually alive for the moment. Now finally cleaned up with Quill Spray. Behind that, though, Waitsu in some trouble and uses Hex once again. This is going to be a three-for-two exchange as Na'Vi takes a big win up in this top lane. They're going to be able to push off of that as well. And it cost them relatively nothing. Didn't even have to spend RP. Just basically ran in circles and chased down squishy supports. Yeah, Liquid making small errors that are really, really hurting them. Um, them trying to go for that gank looked good for Liquid at first, but the Vanguard from Bristleback pretty much makes them unkillable at this point in time. Uh, it also goes back to those small pickoffs, like Bulba taking an arrow to the face, TV, TC overextending himself in the lane. Like, those small things don't happen. Maybe Na'Vi don't have an easy time like this finding kills and being able to make trades. Fluff's going to, well, actually, he has no follow-up whatsoever. He doesn't even have... <laughs> yeah. I thought he was going to throw down the Purge and we were going to see maybe Shadow Shaman coming in time, but he doesn't even have that Purge. So now they might be in a trouble, though. Yep, exactly. And this is what I was going to say. Way too dead for sure. And the wards go down. They may end up killing off Funic with the Eclipse. It cost him a lot to do it. Fluff's still in a little bit of trouble, but the bird finally does drop. And Bulba trying to chase down KKY as he chases Koikva, so a little bit of silly play really of Na'Vi. They had no business hanging around that long. That was a pure out-and-out -out win if they had just fallen back and got a little bit greedy. But yeah, that uh, when Fluff landed in there with that disruption, it kind of reminded me of Puppy going, alright guys, black hole blink into the broche pit like we saw uh, in game two, and it's like, oh, nobody's here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, either way, we're all knotted up in the kill board, six to six, but the gold remains in favor of Navi, as does the experience. Yep, right now they're just uh, pretty much farming much more efficiently than Liquid. I think we've seen that pretty much every single game, that Navi take the, the early laning phase, even if they're, they Liquid have an advantage in some sort of lane situation or some sort of specific 1v1 matchup or something like that. Navi are always able to manipulate the lanes well enough and then use what they have to be able to maximize their farm. Like, Funic is just the perfect example of that. Now has FaZe a cloak and a Vanguard means he doesn't have to worry about uh, TC and his ultimate anymore because all he has yep. to do is turn his back and then cloak will also help. And uh, Dire Courier wow. going down. Looks like uh, Koifa was able to snag that one. Well played again from Koikva, who has really been... I mean, and this is... Since he joined Liquid, he's just been such a huge part of what they do. And every match you watch, it's rare to see him play and not say he was a big factor. He just always is. But take a look at TC's item build. He went Treads, Aquilae, and now straight up to a BKB. Absolutely no greed item whatsoever. No Midas, no Helm of the Dominator... Uh, no, nothing. Not even a Yasha before BKB, which um, very often you can be seen as it can be seen as a greed item because it helps you with split push. But we're gonna see Moonlight Shadow popped, and there is a Sentry Ward down from Liquid. Way too, the one furthest out right now will be able to scurry to safety as the rest of Liquid responds. But uh, okay, no, he's actually gonna transition. He went Ogre Club just to tank up. Now he's gonna be on his way to a Helm of the Dom. In the meantime, Hex on the fun. Can they catch him? Miss with the Ward Trap. There's an RP to disjoint it and two blown to pieces immediately. 
That was a missed ward trap from way too. And unfortunately, they might get funnic nonetheless. Bulba's right behind him and doesn't have a spirit to throw out. Does manage to bring down the bird. But I uh, just heard a sacred arrow. There it is. Going to shoot a bit wide. But yeah, first RP of the game shot. Did the cut too and blew him to pieces. Yeah, I like how Vos coming in just like, oh, uh, wards are down, huh? I'll, I'll go ahead and clean up that extra bit of gold. No yeah. problem. It's all uh, good. No worries. But yeah, right now, just another mistake, I would say, from Liquid. The fact that Moonlight yeah. Shadow went down, and you know something's coming after that. Well, what's? it's not going to be Bristleback running forward and getting a good position with his invis. It's going to be Dendi. Like, th there is no other hero who's really going to utilize Moonlight Shadow as well as Dendi will. Being able to put him in himself in a good enough position to find that blink RP and... Uh, and get that big stun. So the fact that they tried to come back out after the Moonlight Shadow was popped, Moonlight Shadow popping tells you Dendi's there. Dendi's there, and he's going for you, and you should not be trying yep. to go out. And they did, and they immediately just get bit. That was the first time that Dendi really showed his power, and he's coming in again, even without an RP. The invis positioning might just give him a really, really good skewer, or at least put him close enough to blink skewer. Just about 25 seconds left on reverse polarity, and they may be able to wait this out. Liquid seems kind of tunnel visioned on this top tier one, and it could end up costing them if they just hang around for exactly every reason you just so eloquently explained. Is you know, you have to expect these things are coming. Invis rune on the mag, and Navi for the moment holding serve at the very least. Uh, 14 seconds on Moonlight Shadow now. They're going to have a chance to do this e the exact same way by the time all is said and done. Dendi has RP up. Moonlight Shadow is now up. Two seconds off. This could be horrendous. Oh, this could get ugly so fast. Dendi in position, hiding in the trees. There's a disruption under the tower. That's funny. There's Moonlight Shadow popped. AA ultimate shot. They're spreading out wisely in anticipation of Dendi. And we see the RP up to the top. They managed to get way too and no one else. Now here comes the Eclipse. TC trying to clean up and do work, but no targets for the Eclipse. Shadow Shaman's wards doing the work they're supposed to do. And Funic a little too low to really be coming forward. However, with the Glyph, they may be able to save it or at least deny it. TC and Bulba continuing to try to zone them out. And Puppy popping Chilling Touch for the next little bit of bonus damage. And nope, Prophet got it. There's a disruption in the meantime on the Puppy. Puppy comes out and dead to rights. Never had a chance. Cold feet will proc on TC, but the arrow shot just south of him. So a bit of an extended siege here from Liquid, but it ends up working out after all. Yeah, that was uh, a little bit surprising. They set themselves up really well for counter wards for the Moonlight Shadow, but then they committed. Like, I think they were hoping that they would bait out Na'Vi trying to get this sneaky, oh, we're going to Moonlight Shadow again, and try and catch them, and Liquid would get them by surprise because they had such good coverage all throughout this area where Moonlight Shadow would be effective. And it was, it was really, really good. It's just Na'Vi never took the bait. So Liquid had to get aggressive there, and they traded a lot away for that Tier 1 tower. Not only did they throw a support down and that died, and they didn't get anything in an exchange immediately. They got Puppy later on, but... Really, at first, they didn't get anything for it, but they barely got a Tier 1 tower in exchange for wards. Demonic Purge on the front at the top. He's going to try to do damage before he drops. They've got a whole gaggle of folks there. Here come the Vincent Familiars to try to help, but they do bring him down. Balba even spent the Earth Splitter just to be safe. AA Ultimate is there, but yeah, Way 2 should be just fine. So, bit of a reaction from Navi, but it's a little late in the coming. They end up losing Funic. In the meantime, Puppy and Marana. Uh, Havos, I should say, continuing to just farm away. He has gone with a Diffusal build. Straight up Treads, Diffusal. Not even a BKB to be, to be had in there. Yeah, and right now you can see their uh, Na'Vi, that gold lead, is dipping back down a little bit as the pushing power comes into play from Liquid. They take a tower, and uh, now they're only a little, sh just shy of 3,000 gold ahead and uh, about 5,000 experience ahead. So... Navi still controlling this game well, but we do have a, a little bit of stacking that's going on in the Ancients that uh, TC is going to be able to farm up. He's still working on his BKB. Honestly, while BKB is down, I think Navi should continue to try and get aggressive and fight uh, Liquid every turn. Oh yeah, I totally agree. There's another Demonic Purge we're going to hear. It's going to be Kuroki this time. Fluff, though, going to end up trading one for one, a double KO. There in the dire side jungle, and the rest of Liquid wisely going to vacate the premises. And, yeah, I mean, so far, Liquid's getting some things done. Dindy's got a double damage and spins the RP on TC. Big pick off here if they can secure it. Skewer's in back, and that'll be that. 
That is huge. And we're actually going to see BKB popped by Dendi. They're going to get a return kill on the Ancient Apparition at least. Bulba's hitting very hard right now. We haven't talked a whole lot about him, but he already has up Drums, Phase, and an Ogre Club. Marana, in the meantime, going to work on Koikva. Starstorm's there for extra damage. Do they have it? Good stomp. And that's going to be a big return kill for Liquid. Now, Funic there trying to track down Bulba. Bulba moving forward. Bailed out by Fluff. Fluff hits the disruption. There's an Earth Splitter and the Demonic Purge. Funic drawn back into it, but no follow-up as they fear what's coming out of the shadows on the other side. Although only, only Visage was up. They probably could have taken a chance there, but instead deciding to play even. In the end, it's a two-for-two two trade. They lose Marana and Mag in exchange for the Luna and the Nature's Prophet. Roughly a break-even affair. Yeah, I think that was the smarter play there from Bulba. Much more... Uh well, maybe we're going to see more, Funic. They shouldn't be Dis able to go on this. Yeah. Funic is, be is too big at this point in time. With Vanguard yeah. and Hood of Defiance, chasing a Bristleback is pretty much the worst thing you could do. Um, mm. You know, even just the Visage sitting in behind or the Ice Blast coming in from the AA could have easily wrecked them. They came ahead in that team fight. Sure, they lost the Luna, but they gained a lot for it. They killed Dendi. They killed the Marana. Uh, you know, a lot of good things happened there. That was a three for four trade, I believe, for them. So why not just walk away from the team fight uh, and... Uh, be happy about about what you were able to get because they do have late game with the Luna. The later this game goes, at least until the BKB is up, um, they should be trying to just extend this game a little bit longer. And in the meantime, we're going to see Havos picked off once again. And <laughs> Funic has Quills quite literally spraying as we speak, and that will be the death of, uh, of Fluff for sure, as I'm pretty sure he's in range of those. And yeah, he should be. But anyway... Take a look at the gold graph. We can see Liquid is not only uh, holding holding things together, they're actually making up ground. Very reminiscent of the way Game 1 felt where Na'Vi seized a... It was a much more commanding lead by the time all was said and done, but still just gradually built themselves a lead, and Liquid gradually turned it around. And they've managed to likewise stop the bleeding and reverse the uh, reverse the wound here in Game 3 as well. What a what a hell of a series this has been. Yeah, this is this has to be like... One of those top, I mean, for 2014 at least, this has got to be one of the top five series that we're going to see. And we're only into February so far. But this is, this is just uh, absolutely one of the most entertaining series that I've ever had the, uh, the pleasure to be able to cast, let alone just watch. So it's been a lot of fun. But no, Liquid are doing, I, I like the way they're playing. They're playing this kind of scrappy, right? They're moving around. They're getting these, uh, these small pickoffs. They're trading hit for hit. And all the meanwhile, they're just kind of extending the game, which is like Na'Vi's lineup is supposed to be really, really strong right now. They're really coming into their own with all their mid-game firepower, with the Marana finally getting into some sort of carry role. Uh, Funic looking very, very good. Then you've got the two supports that are pretty burst heavy in the Ice Blast and the Vistage Nuke. You know, that's a lot of heavy damage coming out. Liquid are not shying away from that. In fact, a lot of times they're the ones grouping up five manning and putting the pressure. And a lot of this goes right back to the Elder Titan. Bulba's Elder Titan is many teams, many people underestimate the power of an Elder Titan being able to pick up all that extra damage with his spirit. All he needs is... Movement speed in the phase boots and drums, so that way when you do bring the spirit back, you're practically sitting at, at max movement speed, and you're able to just constantly run after heroes and beat them down, but also a BKB. Once he has that BKB up, they will continue to fight. Liquid are not backing down. They're not just going, okay, Navi, you control the game right now. We'll push later. They're actually doing a lot of really good trading, even if it isn't altogether in their favor. They're still getting the towers. They're still getting that basic amount of gold that will go into the BKB instead of just sitting back trying to farm and let Navi get all the pickoffs they need. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, Liquid is, has already shown just in this series alone that they know how to manage this kind of a situation. They know how to manage a map and to just eke their way back in and... And yeah, th this is still anyone's game to win or to lose, really. I mean, Marana, as much as I knocked on her during the draft, I mean, she's not terrible as a hard carry. I, it just the way she tends to play out from that position is just so hit and miss. And, you know, it's not like uh, like even a Luna for just to use a counterpoint where you go, well, if she gets a certain number of CS, doesn't die a whole lot, and manages to get up items X, Y, and Z, she's going to be a force to reckon with. Marana so often, even the way she builds, builds is so dependent on what she's up against, and it just 
takes her so long and so much to really get to that full carry status. And I feel like that is the big liability that Navi's facing right now. I mean, as good as Bristleback is, and he's going to continue to be excellent, especially against the Luna because of the Quill Spray going through BKB, which is usually the big survival mechanism a Luna relies upon until she manages to get a Satanic in the very late game. Um, as good as he is, though, I mean, when you're talking about a Nature's Prophet and a Luna coming down the stretch with the bonuses an Elder Titan will confer, given the fact Bulba has been off to a pretty damn good start again here in this game. In fact, take a look at the net worth. We can see he's right on par with Havost, even though Havost is again in the one position. Um, he'll be able to pick up a quick scythe, a Shivas, etc. I really just like Liquid's lineup uh, a lot better once you get to 40 minutes and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really agree. Pretty much uh, Marana is, I, I've kind of described her as sort of this jack of all trades, but but master of none. When it comes to the semi-carry and carry position, um, she's not actually that that strong. She she can't really hard carry as many other heroes can. She's very, very excellent in the mid game, but you're right. It, her whole entire, basically her biggest strength is her versatility and the fact that her build is able to fluctuate based on what you're up against. So whether you run a defensive try lane, run a hard carry Marana that is trying to farm up, you know, the uh, uh, like Lincoln's Desolator, like that kind of build that is just sort of enough defensive that you're able to, to push out and constantly split push, and then you just go, go, go until you have Manta and Desolator, and then you finally are that heavy hitting carry. Or you can go for a much more offensive, run an aggressive try lane, try and shut down heroes, and then rely on some other semi carry to back you up. Now, that's where Bristleback really comes into play, is that having a one Marana. You're right. It, it's not very good, and it's why you rely, oftentimes, Marana is described more as a semi-carry than a hard carry in her own right, because she relies on other heroes to be able to pick up. So if you pick up a carry Marana, you either have to end the game early, or you have to have a mid or offlane hero who's going to be able to accentuate the damage that you already output with added, whether it's minus armor or burst or extra physical damage. Heroes like Templar Assassin, Bristleback, those kind of heroes who are able to output their own physical damage of their, uh, of their own kind really help out a Marana, help her be able to shoulder that carry role a lot better. And then you include a big playmaking hero like Magnus. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I think this is a strong lineup, but you're absolutely right. Na'Vi do need to start controlling the map better, and they need to be able to end this game before 40 minutes. It's not that they can't contest Liquid going after the 40-minute mark because they do have, again, we focus on the carries, and that's important, but the late-game potential is also coming from the supporting cast, and one of oh, the yeah. biggest ones is Ancient Apparition, and you could see how the combo of Magnus hitting an RP mixed in with a good eye Blast. It doesn't even have to be a big one. It could be very, very small because of that tight circle. can easily do enough damage, and then just the measly follow-up of physical damage coming out from the Marana and the Bristleback will be enough to clear through the Heroes of Liquid. It's just going to be very, very tough after the 40-minute mark, like you said. Yeah, and a lot of it comes down to lockdown, too. Liquid just has so much more of it. And, but you know, Bristleback and Marana. Bristle survives on the fact that, okay, he can just run around, run in circles, you know, war pass stacks, what have you. But when he's stationary, when he's shackled, when he's hexed, whenever he's uh, purged, etc., it doesn't really work that way. And same thing with Marana. Marana relies on her innate skill set, Moonlight, Shadow, and Leap, to keep her alive. And whenever you have so many ways to account for her, it's problematic. And that's kind of the issue Navi's going to run into is, let's say they engage a team fight, you lose your Marana and Bristle gets injured or vice versa and has to play towards the back of the fight. You hit a five-man reverse polarity, best of your life. Then you hit an AA ultimate. Excellent. Then where's the damage if you lose one of those two heroes and the other one is, is hurting and, and is susceptible to being bursted or hexed? So we'll see how they end up playing. Now, it looks like there's some kind of a lag issue. That's kind of all the report we've got. Um, Way2 said he just yelled lag and DC'd. So uh, hopefully we'll have Bulba back on uh, shortly. But just to reiterate, if you just joined the broadcast, make sure you head to d2cl.org. Pretty damn big news over there regarding uh, new uh, new stretch goals, I guess is what you can call them, to take a page from Kickstarter's book. Um, all of the ticket sales and support for the league has been phenomenal so far, and I'm not going to run through them as uh, Capitalist has already done that. You can certainly go read for yourselves, but pretty big deal. The biggest one of which worth mentioning, though, is the option to select a site for land finals for next season of D2CL if we're able to eclipse 50,000 tickets sold. So if you already own a ticket, maybe you'll consider picking up a second one just to try and get us that much closer to that goal. Or if uh, you haven't picked up a ticket yet, we'd love for you guys to give that a thought, not just for the great content and the awesome punch set that comes with it, but as well for the... Uh, okay, go. Ready? Uh, he's not back. But... Um, <laughs> but... Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, not just for the punch set, not just for the awesome content, but also just to help grow yet another outstanding tournament that I'm so privileged to be a part of. All right. Sounds like Boba is getting back into the game now uh, as he's just opened up Dota. But yeah, uh, also don't forget, guys, we are going to be doing another Dota 2 Lounge giveaway after this game. Both AC and I are going to be giving it away at our Twitters. So you can follow AC at A-Y-E-S-E-E, -E -E, AC, just his name spelled out. And you can follow me over at, at Dota Capitalist. Both of us are going to be giving away another 10 rares. All you have to do is put in the code that we uh, put out into uh, Dota2Lounge.com slash giveaways, and uh, you get your chance. If you're the first one to be able to put in that code, you get 10 free rares. So pretty simple, pretty easy. And now Bulba's coming back. We'll have to see. Uh, Fluff is definitely dead. Way too, on the other hand, <laughs> does have a teleport scroll, and there is no immediate disable on the front. We have Visage Birds coming in. If he teleports right away, he might be good, but Dendi's also coming. Fluff gone, way too. Back to safety, and Dindy got there just a little late to the party, but uh, 13 to 13, and this remains a tight one. 2,000 gold, all that separates these two teams, the 22 minutes of play behind us. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how this plays out. I do feel like this game, one way or the other, is going. <laughs> and Kuro says, yeah, really good reactions, bro. GG pause. But um, I, I feel like one way or the other, the bulk of this game is going to be decided over the next 10 minutes, possibly over the next five. Yep, this uh, Ancient Apparition, he's about, not only he's level 9, so he's getting towards that level 2 ultimate here pretty soon, uh, especially with the lower experience from 10 to 11, but also the fact that he's absolutely going to have that point booster in time, and that AA ult, it's one of the biggest upgrades in the game when it comes to Aghanims, Ice Blast ranks there as, as top notch, because that oh, yeah. extra bit of time for, uh, uh, for uh, what's it called, Shatter, Shattering when they go below a certain percentage of health, that added time to yep. that is huge in team fights. So they get Roche, they're about to get that as well. They're looking very, very good. Liquid, though, are trying to pick up some gold of their own. They may just snag tier two here. Yep, wards are down from way two, and really no reason for Navi to contest this, I don't think. They would have to. to you know, at this point, they can honestly just counter push. And Navi's feeling very brave right now. They are. Like, um, so many of these fights are just going to be determined by Dindy. Will he hit an RP? How many will he get? Does he get two? Good. Does he hit three? That's probably a one fight every single time with the lineup they have. If he's able to execute and able to do his job, they're going to be in great shape. Liquid, on the other hand, has an excellent team in punishing that. And as we've, uh, during that pause, uh... Uh, ruminated on at quite a bit of length. We both believe in Liquid's uh, uh, liquid superiority in the late game. So Navi wanting to continue to keep the pressure up now and not let it reach that point. Dindy up front, and we're going to see another arrow dodged by Fluff. Just sidestepped it a bit. And Liquid able to hold things together while taking the Tier 2. Never good to give up an Aegis, but if you're going to give it up, may as well get something out of it. And so long as you're able to force them back, and force them uh, to play a little defensive, even just for a minute, so you can catch your breath. That's usually considered a win, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're farming up the jungle. They did a little damage to the Tier 3. Uh, you know, even if this Tier 2 does go down, you know it's going to eventually. They're mm -hmm. buying themselves time. They're letting this game right. extend. Even if you look at the gold graph and you go, oh, Navi's getting more and more gold. Yeah, sure, they're getting more gold than Liquid is out of the map right now. But Liquid might be able to actually utilize that, that lesser amount of gold they're, they're getting in a better situation. That's what mm -hmm. Luna's really good at. She farms well, but if she gets a certain amount of gold, she's going to utilize it very, very well because of the bouncing glaives or her... Uh, anytime you increase her survivability, Eclipse gets a little bit better because you're guaranteed to get that full duration off. Yada, yada, yada. It's just so many different things that Luna is so strong at being able to go into the late game. So right now, Liquid are doing this right. They're dodging team fights. They're farming up where they can. They're putting pressure when Navi are taking objectives. So is Liquid. So everything that's going right, right now for, for Liquid is just all centered around them being passive and them farming up. As, uh, as long as Navi never finds that initiation, they're going to find themselves taking a Tier 2, taking, uh, well, all the Tier 2s are still up for Liquid, but once they clear yep. through all those Tier 2s and they start going uphill, that's when they know, oh no, it's 40 minutes in, it's too late, TC's looking really, really good. And how do we push uphill against an Elder Titan and a Luna who's very, very farmed with a Furion constantly split pushing us? Yep. And speaking of Furion, he's actually picked himself up an Orchid Malevolence, and I really, really like this pickup on him, and it tells you a lot about what they view as their threats. Hold that thought as Kuro is probably just flat out dead. Do they have a disruption? Nope, got the stun off and the disruption, so 
a little overkill, but you know what? Securing a kill, no such thing as overkill at this stage of the game. Aegis is halfway done with its time, and we've seen Navi get nothing out of it but a little bit of farm, which we both agree suits Liquid just fine. But with that Orchid pick up instead of the Scythe of Ice, that tells you, I mean, they're just really worried about bringing down the Bristleback. Yes, the silence is there, but use, you, know, you can use that on any number of heroes, but more importantly, just being able to guarantee that you're going to get the bonus damage that comes out of that to bring down some of these tankier heroes really matters a ton uh, to their overall game plan. Funny trying to bum rush Ball, but he's actually going to be stomped out. There's an Earth Splitter as well. That's going to slow him down. And he's Orchided. This is exactly what I was talking about. And in the meantime, Marana did manage to clean up Fluff and uh, TC elsewhere, but being able to bring down the uh, Bristle back at top, a pretty nice return kill for Liquid is at the same time. Yeah, that wasn't bad. They had to commit a lot to getting that bristle back, and they still almost didn't get him. But what, uh, yeah, we're just so focused on being able to cover that one. Well, actually, Koifa picks off the Ancient Apparition as well. <laughs> That's the danger yep. of the Shadow Blade Orchid. Really easy to pick off those supports. But yeah, oh, yeah. I think Navi got the better of that trade. Uh, the Ancient Apparition going down is pretty bad, but shutting down the Luna is so good for Liquid that even if it was two for two, uh, excuse me, it's good for Navi. So shutting down that uh, Luna. And also being able to have enough map control to possibly take this tier two as well as we're only just now getting those teleports in. Shadow Shaman dropped his wards and Waitsu able to bring down the tier one. Reaction down at bottom tier two standing just outside of deny range for now. So Navi should be able to come back and get that at their leisure really. Roche is going to be back up. Oh, well, we'll know how long Roche is going to be back up here in a few minutes at the very least. But at this point, we're 28 minutes on the money. And it's 16 to 15, and that gold graph continues to head north. We're getting very close to the zero line now, and Liquid has got to be feeling happy about their chances as we get closer and closer to 30 minutes and inevitably closer to the late game. Yeah, and with the Aegis about to be reclaimed... Dendy's looking for a pickoff right now with his Invis rune. He wants to be able to find something, and they've got a really good aggressive ward right now to be able to see some of the movement of these heroes. But for right now, Liquid are, are doing a really good job keeping their spacing and farming up. Well, TC. Yep, skewered back following the RP and pops a BKB. Now in the middle of the fight, they managed to take the Aegis for free. It was just about to expire anyway. Liquid in a great position, though, and we're going to see Mirana. Trying to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, way too hit with the defusal. They want to bring him down, but no. Shockwave not enough. There's the Eclipse on the back of it. Dindy and company have to clear out as Bulba is leading the charge. Leading with the chin and should be able to track down Dindy. No, actually. Runs out of steam and overextends himself badly. Behind the fight, though, Liquid coming through that big choke point. Eats a lot of damage. It's two for one so far. They did get the Aegis. Now two for two. They killed TC again. They should be able to get Fluff here, and they will. Liquid, way greedy and really <laughs> against this team. Koifa's there to clean things up, though, and he's going to get a double kill out of it. Phonix now on his tail, though. He's got an Orchid, but no, sprouts himself in and ends up cleaned up. So that's going to be a four-for-four four exchange. And really, though, Liquid, they kind of asked for that, chasing all the way through, but more importantly, bottlenecking right here trying to chase them through their side of the jungle and just getting a little hung up on each other. 20-19, to 19, and as the dust settles, even though Liquid briefly led the game for the first time in 30 minutes, barely in favor of Navi, so still anyone's game to win or to lose. Yeah, that, that team fight was very, very close. I mean, what? Furion coming in at the end, him trading himself for two different kills, absolutely worth it. Even if Furion's farm is a little bit more important than Dendi's, it was still really good pickoffs for him. And he, and he got some good, um, good uh, what's it called, uh, reliable gold to be able to fall back on. So even when he did die to the Bristleback, it's not bad. Another thing is Liquid, 4 for 4, yeah, they lost the Luna, and Bristleback's looking pretty damn big now. But they also yep. just extended the game. Like, the, the game just drew out just a little bit longer after that team fight. So, it definitely was a great team fight for Na'Vi. Uh, they came out a little bit on top, but that's sort of uh, hurt by the fact that such a close fight does not spell uh, well for Na'Vi. As we start getting 30 minutes in, 35 minutes in, it's going to get tougher and tougher. So, them uh, this game being drawn out more and more and more is, is kind of hurting Na'Vi, and they're going to try and speed things up right now with a smoke. See if they can get a pick off. Start taking, finally taking these tier twos, which are available to them. I wonder if Bulba notices this tier two tower is deniable. And that could definitely help. I mean, being able to limit that tower gold away from Navi is really important right now. And taking a look, yeah, I mean, right now, 
Navi trying to find a target. They're being very methodical about it, though. They smoked quite some time ago. Yeah, they're going to go ahead and use Moonlight Shadow. And here comes TC. And he's got to know something's up. This is just a little bit of an odd situation. Bulba throws out the stomp. And not going to matter. They take a big stack away from TC. That's a pretty big coup in and of itself. Uh, Bulba able to dodge the arrow in the meantime. But, you know, that's one of the big advantages of Aluna, especially when you go the build he did. He went Morbid Mash straight up to Helm of the Dominator following the completion of his BKB. But whenever you're having your Ancients taken, and we can see Navi's even got a ward down, that really hurts a lot. That slows down your item progression so, so much. Yeah, right now, Furion is is the other big factor. Like, they're doing a good job shutting down the Luna, but Furion's getting really, really big, and he's soon going to have that sight device, meaning that Navi can never split up at that point. And Weitzu caught out, spins the Hex. We'll go ahead and drop his wards in the meantime. He gets the Shackles down onto Dindy. Here comes the Earth Splitter. It's going to be off the mark. Funnick in the meantime going to work on Quakefa. TC's there trying to tee off on Funnick. Funnick's eating a lot of damage, and they do manage to bring him down. That's a very big kill for him, given he has died twice in the last two engagements. And the oh, RP caught TC. Beautiful disruption from Fluff, though, to disjoint things. However, it doesn't matter. They skewer him back. The BKB is up on Bulba. TC's still going. Doesn't have the clips. Has to try and find a way out of the fight. And Bulba just going the to town. In the meantime, Marana and KKY drop TC for the third time in just about as many minutes. And those deaths are beginning to pile up. That's the one thing you can't do on a Marana. You can choose not to come to fight. You can choose instead to flash farm, to split push. But you cannot, simply should not, be dying as often as he is. Thankfully, he's got a team that's still standing and able to take a tier two as, as a reprisal. Yeah, that was a really unfortunate situation because Navi, they didn't have the Ice Blast up. As Dendi went in, I'm not sure if he knew or not, but the Ice Blast was on cooldown for another five seconds. So that was a really good setup, and they would have uh, maybe crushed that fight a little bit better if they had hit that Ice Blast on Elder Titan as well, uh, not just the Luna. But as it is, he was brought back, skewered back, and by the time it was up, BKB was activated. And he's the other, like, he's actually providing as much, if not more, of team fight than Luna is right now. Koifa is the big other hero with his big uh, Scythe of Ice pickup recently. So he's looking really, really good. But Navi's still not having the firepower to convincingly win a team fight and turn this into objectives. And, and this is getting tough for them. They're losing team fights bit by bit. They're losing more and more ground. Now, they do have a couple of big pickups. Aghanims is going to be up on Visage. Um, we do have an AC that's going to be purchased by Funic, And that's going to be big for him. I'm not sure. Dendi did have that Shiva's a little while ago. Uh, I'm pretty sure. But that's still going to be a helpful pickup. And uh, anything that uh, Havos gets right now. Well, Fluff's going to get caught. Yep, Fluff caught out, and that's probably going to be a free Aegis. Shadow Demon, a very important hero in how they want to take these fights. And with anyone down, they're just, yeah, they really can't uh, contest this all that well. And, yeah, they're not even going to try. They're going to try and keep an eye on it, and they see how low Roshan already is. Doing what damage they can, they try to disjoint it with the sleep, but, again, really doesn't matter as... Marana picks up the Aegis, leaves a gem behind that Funnick will happily snag. And that's a gigantic turnaround for Na'Vi. And Na'Vi has just capitalized. We can see, in the meantime, Liquid has managed to bring the goal back into their favor. The experience still in favor of Na'Vi, though. But having that Aegis, if they can just get a big win here, hang on, they're going to go for it. And Marana jumping right up into it. Stomp's not going to be effective at all. And Waitsu drops the wards. They're going to be able to get his Aegis for free. How many times has Havos done that in the last three games? The wards went down, so it cost Liquid a bit, too, and they're going to be able to clean it up for some free gold. But that's an Aegis basically spent for no particular good reason other than to bring down Way Too Sexy. Yeah, it's not a bad pickoff, but it's just not the edge that they really need in order to ensure they've got good team fights. Like something like an Elder Titan or, or Luna or Furion, those are the trades that you're willing to make for an Aegis. As it is, it might be a tough fight if Na'Vi choose to go for this uh, Tier 2, but it doesn't even look like they're going to go for it here. And... Um, you know, to give them a little bit more credit into their late game, Havos now being able to pick up an Eagle Song, like you do have a decent amount of damage. It just all comes back down to their Wombo combo of, of the RP mixed in with the Ancient Apparition Agadims. That's the only reason that they could possibly take Liquid going 45, 50 minutes in. It's just better execution with those two combos and then all the damage that it's able to follow up from there. But again, as, as always, when, uh, when we're talking about late game, it's going to come down to whether or not the initiation is favorable. Radiant.
Tier 2 mid drops and Liquid still with three towers standing. They maintain a fairly decent tower lead over top of Navi, at least for now. But Navi going to retreat back to the jungle. All this time, though, Koikva has just been adding more and more gold to his pockets. He already has a Scythe of Ice, Orchid, and Shadow Blade up. See what he wants now. As of as it stands at the moment, he is the lockdown master. They just can't afford to lose him. And Koikva wisely decides it's time to find his way back to more familiar territory, heading back into the Radiant Jungle. Yeah, Koikva is doing a really good job. When they were taking Roshan, he put pressure on the Tier 3. You look at it, it's below half health. You know, he's, mm -hmm. so he's doing a good job finding space, even though he doesn't have that pushing uh, build for a Furion. He's got more of a combative pickoff build with Orchid and Scythe of Ice. If he had a, a, a Necronomicon, that tower would be dead right now. But despite the fact that he doesn't have a good pushing build, and this build, I think, is preferable for this specific game, uh, he's still doing a really good job putting pressure on these Tier 2s and Tier 3s. And every single time I watch him, he maximizes his time where he can sit there, beat on the tower, but gets out just before Na'Vi could make rotations to shut him down. And it's why he only has two deaths so far, is because he's a master being able to figure that out. Dendi was hoping to find a pickoff on TC by being <laughs> able to skewer him down the cliff, but not going to find it. In fact, it's going to be top. A little bit of wishful thinking up at top. We're going to see the pursue out, and it's going to be Marana picked off again. He even spent a BKB charge there. And that was a little bizarre. A couple of odd mistakes to begin with. Big reactions caught out by Liquid and wasting a pretty heavily. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that was his That was his eight-second BKB charge. So wasting some of those valuable seconds of uh, magic immunity for basically just to die for free. Yeah, and when Luna has a Manta, all of a sudden she becomes a much bigger threat. Now the Manta increases her survivability slightly. It's not going to be that big of help to, the, the again, the late game problem of the uh, the RP plus the, the Ice Blast. But maybe it'll buy him enough time. The big thing right now is that, that Luna will be able to farm very, very quickly and split push and keep up pressure on Na'Vi. And, and even when Na'Vi are going to be 5 manning down a lane or something like that, you're not only going to have to deal with the Fury on now split pushing, but also the Manta Illusions coming out from TC. This is going to win them some more map control, this pickup from TC. And Liquid doing a good job of, of taking over the uh, the jungle of Navi, this top tower, as you pointed out a couple of times, already whittled down to half health, and they're in a position where they could try to take a fight. Koikva is sufficiently far ahead now with 2,500 gold on top of that. I'm anxious to see if he's going to want to build a Desolator here. I feel like a Desolator would be a nice pickup. It would help things out uh, enormously in and of their own right, allow him to push a little more effectively, help the loon out as well, or he could end up going pure, uh, pure crit, just deciding to pick up a Crystallis if he feels like it, although, nope, it's going to be an MKB. So anticipating uh, Marana's butterfly build, seeing the Eagle Song already done, it's going to be coming out just in time for this uh, butterfly to be finished on Havos. So, uh, yeah, I actually would have figured it would have been Luna who would have picked up the MKB, but instead going to be going the way of the Nature's Prophet. And Koikva now takes on an just even more importance. He's the main source of damage that can be reliable against Havost. Yeah, this is why the combative build is so good on a Furion, specifically against Marana. Marana is, uh, again, a carry. She's not a hard carry necessarily because she operates from a gold advantage. Um, she's not a very good carry if she's behind or on even footing. So you compare that to the Furion, who's going a pure combative build, also a hero that is able to operate as a sort of semi-carry when you have a gold advantage. But how do you out... out uh, how do you out... Uh, uh, Furion when it comes to mm -hmm. getting that gold. Like, there's no way Marana can keep up with that, especially with how well Koipa is playing right now. So he just instantly 1v1s anybody right now. Most importantly, the Marana is the big pickoff. We see Navi taking down one of Liquid's towers at top, the top tier one, as a matter of fact, one of the last remaining outer tier towers on uh, either side at this point. Navi only having one, Liquid now down to just two. And Liquid dropping the wards as well. So they're going to try to trade Tier 2 for Tier 2. That's a two-for-one change exchange going the way of Na'Vi now. And Liquid has to pull back to defend. Now, they, they use the Serpent Wards to bring down the Tier 2. And if they decide to push here, they're not going to have it. Doesn't look like that's going to be the plan, though, at least not for the moment. Na'Vi, yeah, they are going to go ahead and withdraw. Yeah, Liquid uh, did something really smart there, even though you couldn't tell from the way Na'Vi were actually getting aggressive. 
Uh, Liquid did the smart thing in that they moved forward, they got the wards out, they got the illusion, and immediately backed out. They didn't care if the tower got denied, they didn't care if there was any sort of response from Na'Vi to be able to kill the wards or keep the tower alive or whatever. They just wanted to survive. Oh, RP got way too in Bulba. A fake back from Na'Vi is successful using Moonlight Shadow as their cover to sneak up and land a big RP. There's a buyback from Shadow Shaman. Bulba has it as well. And they're probably going to need him. And way too buying back. Doesn't have wards. There's the pipe pop. There's a disruption. Trying to just get some more illusions up and running. Create more damage opportunities for Luna and her illusions. And try to stem the tide. Bulba's still down for quite some time. About 40 seconds, though. He's back up and running. Phonic, in the meantime, happy to tank that tower damage right in the kisser. And down goes the tier 3. There's a demonic purge on the Phonic. AA ultimate passes through, but no follow. And in the meantime, Murata... Managing to pick off the Ancient Apparition elsewhere. Now behind that, we're going to have Dindy skewering back Fluff, and the Eclipse is up, but TC not doing as much damage as he would like. Koikva in a lot of trouble as well, and he's going to be dying behind his own Tier 3. TC making a run for the well. Funic diving all the way to the Tier 4s of the Ancient. Visage Familiar stuns are there, and TC drops. TC has buyback, and they may have to use it in Funic. Somehow able to survive. There's the buyback coming out immediately from Koikva and the Shadow Demon, but the damage is done, the racks are gone, and this game solidly in control of Na'Vi now. Getting into the late game, just a few minutes past 40 minutes, we knew it was going to be key, and they managed to get the job done and take a pretty solid lead. Yeah, now they're getting desperate. They need a pick off here, and anything small, even Kuro, is going to be worth it. Visage Familiars buy some time. Don't think it's going to do much, but delay the inevitable. But as you said, there's another RP fresh off cooldown. They move forward. They're going to bring down Fluff and now Koikva next on the list. They needed a pick off. What they ended up doing was feeding Fury on. He's now down for 105 seconds. And back at the base, yeah, everything quite stable, quite happy for Na'Vi as they will <laughs> any day of the week trade away Kuroki's Visage in exchange for Koikva's profit, let alone adding in the Shadow Demon as well. Following that engagement, the gold lead now the biggest it's been all game for Na'Vi, or for anyone for that matter, now right up to about 5,000, but liquid down, but not completely out. Again, they're getting into their wheelhouse now, the Manta done on TC, they just need a win, and they need it right now. Yep, they're going to be able to uh, clean up Roshan, take the Aegis, and then they've got this big advantage where the top lane is constantly pushing in, and uh, Furion going to have to address that for the most part. Like, he's going to be having to do that split push instead of trying to threaten these towers. And top lane was a push, perfect lane for them to push into because that tier 3 tower was at half health. So that means they have some relief from that Furion constantly being at their base, constantly pushing in. Liquid, they just don't have quite enough damage up on Luna. She's got the Manta, and that's like the second stage of a Luna. Honestly, she, TC is very, very far behind in net worth right now because it's supposed to go, you pick up your farming item, you pick up your BKB, and at that point you're like, okay, you're tanky enough to be able to, to be a part of team fights. You pick up Manta, another farming item, another split push item, add some okay damage, to team fights, but it's not enough for late game. And we are getting, we are solidly in the late game, and we don't still don't have that big, like, butterfly pickup for the Luna. So she's honestly not hitting that hard. We saw the illusions go down. The, the five or four different illusions going down from Disruption and Manta, it hardly cleaned up a single creep wave. And that's all yep. because of Luna's lack of damage right now. Yep, and Luna is so far behind in large part because of how many times she's died. Three and seven for TC. Funnick's going to pop the pipe, and they will make it away safely. But yeah, you know, it, it's an, kind of an old maxim. You know, in Dota, kills, kills kind of matter, deaths matter a lot. And when you have your carry, as well-farmed as he might be otherwise, dying seven times in this game, it's just not going to work out for you. It's just not going to go your way. And granted, Havost has fed four, and Funnick has fed six. They've nonetheless, they needed more out of him. Now they're going to pop the BKB and go on way two. BKB's up on both sides, way two. Drops down the wards, it doesn't matter. Now they might be able to get the Murata with the help of some Eclipse damage and the wards. Behind that, though, we see Funnick just going the to town, forcing the Manta out of TC. Good Sprout and Disruption from Fluff to secure TC's escape. Behind that, though, we can see the Stomp locking two in place. That's Havost and Dendi. Rest of the fight playing out back near the Tier 4s as the Tier 3 and the racks here in mid are cleaned up. 
We saw Kuroki pick up that desolator, and it's going to good use for sure. Two racks down, that's probably going to be all she wrote. Um, Liquid can extend this game if they want, and they're certainly going to try to, but it's going to be a bit of wishful thinking with two racks down to think against this lineup because they are pretty damn good at cracking uh, Tier 3s with Moonlight Shadow as well as with Reverse Polarity. Yep, speaking of, they're going to go ahead and use it now. Well, this is interesting. I mean, Illiquid have one shot at being able to win a team fight here and maybe coming back. But it's going to be tough with Hilbos already having the initiation. Refreshers is up on Dendi. He has another RP ready to go, and he will spend it. That time he got Koikva. Shiva's up on both sides, and yeah. Koikva down. Luna's already bought back, but that's just too costly at this point. She's trailing in too many items. Phonic simply does not care. Just shrugging off every piece of damage until... Uh, basically not, yeah, just not giving a damn whatsoever. And Bulba chopped in the back by Dendi. And as the Megas come out, GG's called. 47 minutes, 55 minutes, 75 minutes. One of the longest series I've ever had the privilege to cast. One of the most exciting series I've ever had the privilege to cast. Navi battles back after dropping game one, wins two in a row, and takes the series here at the D2CL. Yeah, this has just been such a fun series. You know, it was close, very, very close, maybe closer than it looked like in the last five minutes. Liquid just had uh, a number of very, very crucial errors. Dendi finally found some good initiations that he was able to just pretty much instantly kill heroes with that, that RP Ice Blast combo. That was great. But really, it was Liquid's overextensions after that fact. They didn't need to chase in. They lost some heroes. They lost their buybacks. They lost so much in the last five minutes when they needed to be playing defensively. They needed to be using their Furion to be able to give them control. And Koipa was trying, too. He just, with his teammates dying like that, he has to be able to respond to Navi going uphill. It should have been just a little bit more of a turtle game for Liquid. And they just... Uh, I mean, it really just comes down to Navi doing a really good job constantly keeping down the Luna. You talked about the, you know, six or seven deaths that was up on TC at that point in time. He just was never able to find the amount of farm he needed to. Even though we're 47 minutes in, we call that late game. Luna hasn't really hit the late game yet. She still needed oh, no. that big Not game shield close. item. Yeah. So really Four well done by Navi taking, uh, taking TC down several notches because of all those ganks. Yep, I was going to say, 4 and 11 GPM down the stretch, just nowhere near where he needs to be. I mean, that's less than Dindy's Magnus. And yeah, that gets inflated a little bit towards the end just because one team tends to run over. You know, you get bonus gold for buildings and such. But for the most part, I mean, his farm was good when you look at pure last hits. It wasn't the best. It was 242. Uh, it was less than Havos, but that happens whenever you uh, whenever you fall behind there towards the end. Plus, I mean, Havos, just an excellent farmer in his own right. Phonic also had more than him. But really, like you said, just kind of one big item off is what it felt like. It felt like if she, for example, had finished up her Satanic, what man might have been totally different. But more than anything, if, if uh, TC just went through that stretch where for about five minutes he died three times in a five-minute, uh, six-minute stretch or something like that. And really from that point on, he just never felt that threatening again. All right, guys. Well, that's going to be it for the stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. We uh, we appreciate it. Dota 2 Champions League. We uh, we do have more. Not only do we have a giveaway that we're going to be doing after this. Uh, first of all, we got uh, two different codes to give away on our Twitters, at Dota Capitalist for me, at AC for, uh, for Mr. Aaron Chambers here. You're going to want to be able to do that because that is free 10 rares that you'll be able to collect over at Dota2Lounge.com slash giveaway. So be sure to uh, check that out. But also, this is not the last um, D2CL match of the night. We do have some more coming out, and I actually forgot what it was, um, was going to be coming up. I believe it was... Um, uh, let's see. I'm, try I'm trying to find it right now to see what match we got coming up tomorrow. Uh, and I think it's an alliance match. Yes, it's alliance versus Fnatic. Yes. Oh, that's going to be fun. <laughs> it absolutely should be. And, yeah, really looking forward to that. You know, taking a look at at uh, everything looking forward for the D2CL. It's been an amazing tournament, an absolute pleasure to cast with you so far, my friend. And thanks again to you and Joy Dota for uh, the opportunity, certainly to the D2CL. And just a reminder, head to D2CL.org, guys. There's a lot of big news taking place over, over yonder in terms of uh, a recent announcement regarding ticket sales and what you guys have made possible. So make sure you go take a look at that. And, uh, yeah, I'll let, I'll let uh, Austin here sum that up for you. 
Yeah, guys, we got a bunch of different things uh, coming up. Uh, pretty much Dota 2 Champions League. They want to be able to announce um, preemptively what they have planned for season three and it's a lot of good stuff first of all uh it first of uh, the first like four but basically your your basic kind of upgrades so yeah you know if you get a certain amount we get some we get to see some interesting modes where we get an only mid championship uh we get to see uh, an ability draft game or, or something they call the gold madness which is basically the players trying to uh basically work play the game for kills in order to get extra money out of it uh, a lot of incentive for a big amount of action um so that is also really really cool but then on top of that uh the first one which i believe has already reached the twenty five thousand tickets sold season three qualifiers will be available for Dota T on Dota TV for all Season 2 ticket holders. So you already get a jump in. You get some added benefit out of the very first milestone of being able to see the uh, the qualifiers. So that is really, really awesome. But then the big thing, of course, being a 50,000 tickets are sold. You guys, the viewers, get to select the city host of Season 3 Land Finals. So Kiev, Moscow, Stockholm, Cologne, Paris, or uh, Valencia. So very, very cool stuff. Um, announcing their land finals and, and allowing you guys pretty much to choose where it's going to be at. So really good stuff, guys, and that's going to be it for the stream. Thank you so much once again for tuning in. Uh, I was Dota Capitalist. He was AC, and uh, we're going to wish you guys a good night. We do have MLG TKO that's still going on, so go over to joindota.com. Click that uh, MLG link where uh, if you're looking for more, so more Dota to watch, go over there. Go watch the MLG stream. You may see me there in an hour or so. Thanks so much, guys. Good night.